My name is Spike Moss. My legal name was Harry Jean Moss, first of nine kids. My mother first brought me here when I was about three years old. And we went back and forth to Missouri to about eight, but she finally dug in because she wanted to be a nurse. And you could go to nursing school here, which was her first heartbreak. And she went, you know, but, uh, and she graduated. But um, they didn't tell her we don't hire black nurses. It affected us in a very negative way because where the library is on Emerson, on both sides of the street, was our first business area. And it went down towards, um, down there towards the Twin Stadium at the bottom of the hill. We had businesses on both sides of the street. The conversation was um, the freeway was coming through there. And so they leveled it and then took the freeway way east of the whole area. But nothing was given to rebuild our business. And to this day, our business has not returned. Well, poverty is at the root of almost all of our pain and frustration. It's not like we're not working people. We've always been. It's not like we don't know how to do anything. We don't do everything. Uh, we were fully employed when we were slaves. And now that we're not, it's become difficult because you discriminate and deny opportunity. So for a white person, they go to school. For us, we got to go to school but be better than for white people, they get a job sometime, their family opens the door. We, we have to always be qualified and then pass. So it's the job that's at the root to where you're going to live and how you're going to live. And when you can't get the job right, it almost guarantees poverty. When you get into poverty and you seem to be stuck, the hostility, the frustration, and the anger comes. But also the most depressing thing that happens from levels of poverty is human beings feel they need a crutch to hold them up against all this madness. So you smoke, you drink, you end up with some drugs, but it's also madness. The anger that comes from uh, being denied and left out and uh, feeling that you can't achieve and you can't accomplish or you're less than does a lot of mental damage to black people. And so what you have at the time of a rebellion is you have a powder keg with a fuse and all you need is someone to light it. The powder keg is there. That, uh, from the West Coast to the East Coast, we were the sole owners of America's ghettos at that time. Mm -hmm. So you had, in a conspiracy, confined us and trapped us and limited us. And so all these programs that came after those rebellions spoke to that confinement of being trapped in the so-called ghetto. Well, the truth of the matter is, I wouldn't say what I think is. A riot is something without a reason or a purpose. People rebel to something that's affecting them in a painful and hurtful way. And usually you have the clarity. Everyone knows what's going on that's wrong. And you will try to speak out. But when there's no voice or no way to speak out, there might be a rebellion some type of way. And when the, the pressure is consistent, it's pushing that powder keg again. That leads to the rebellion that it doesn't take much when you've been denied everything. You know, I, I, I finished the school system in this state without seeing a black teacher or a black principal. So the racism was solid, like it was Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, it was very solid, you know. And so it was easy to push you over the edge because all you did is experience this hardship and this hatred every day anyway. Well, the response of the National Guard, we were throwing things. We weren't responding to them, we responded to them. Now you want to send in a force, but you never send in any help, you know. The only thing he did right, he was willing to listen and learn. But it took a rebellion to get him to come. There was no mayor before him that even came. You know, Hubert H. Humphrey was the mayor when um, on Nicollet, which is today the mall, but it was an avenue, there was S.S. Kresge's, Woolworths, Powers, Pennies, Davies, and Donaldson's. And where the store faced that part of the street, which was Nicollet, they all had soda fountains. The napkin counter's note was, don't serve colors. Well, Humphrey was a mayor. So all the mayors before him, up to him, to the mayor where the rebellion happened, never came with any concern about our community. 
one way or the other. So you're here out of the rebellion, you're not here out of what we deserve. One of the things that I've always said, we're like South Africa. You can live here, but we own it, you know? And that's how we lived and we knew it. Why would you burn down your own community? It's not ours, it's yours. At the time of the rebellion, there were businesses from Washington Avenue, straight up Plymouth to, um, I'd say Xerxes, somewhere like, no, they stopped at Queen. On the corner of Queen was the last store, the supermarket. And on the other side was a white doctor's clinic. And at the other corner was the deli and the white drugstore and then businesses straight down. And so you could go in most of those businesses that we went in daily and never get a job. But it's in the heart of you. And, and up into the rebellion, you had never got a job. We had uh, two large cleaners. We had a theater. We had all these different businesses to the dime store, to the hardware, everything you could think of, gas station, but you weren't allowed to work in the middle of your own neighborhood. So, and then you were mistreated. So at the time of the rebellion, why would you respect that? You know, and I don't think we're the only city that was treated like that, but that's, that's why. So to say that that wasn't there when you put it in writing, when you have footage to prove it, and say, oh, it took a militant to steer them up. No, it took time to understand this ain't going nowhere unless you stand up. And they're not going to stop mistreating us until you stand up. So what that does is say some militants made black people uh, rebel, and then white people didn't do anything to make you rebel. Black people are reactionaries to their own oppression. They're not just out here acting. This is a symptom of this country that uh, was founded first on corruption, it's morally bankrupt, and it's racist. <laughs> so when you stand up, I got a new label for you. You're a troublemaker, you're an activist, uh, you're a militant, all this stuff, when in fact, the true battle and struggle for black America is freedom. When you get in that battle, you're a freedom fighter. Why y'all going all out of the way to get all these names? Because you don't want nobody to notice the people here are still waiting on freedom. Literally. She had that dream from 16, 17 years of age that one day she's going to go to nursing school. When she found out she could go, she went. But nobody told her, don't spend your money and waste your time. You're going to hire a black nurse. And it broke her spirit and most of her will. She started doing day work with that brush in that bucket on her hands and knees. And uh, I remember talking to her about getting up off her knees because I didn't know they had broke her spirit. I thought she could get up. She couldn't get up. You know, they had destroyed her. But I don't say that's just my mom. You know, they take all of our dreams. And, you know, everything was a, a fight. You want to play baseball, fight for it. You want to play football, fight for it. Basketball, fight for it. You want to go to this school, fight for it. You want to work on this job. Nothing was just given because we're American, because we were born here. The only person that's been here longer than us is a Native American. White people had a choice to go, stay. We had only one choice. We had straight, about 18 straight generations right here. He went nowhere. So the Native Americans, the only one been here longer than us. And the first of us that came, we came on Spanish ships as sailors anyway. So uh, the disrespect that was so pervasive and so consistent for so long. And then to try to find a way to wiggle out of it. Uh, there's troublemakers they are making trouble. What kind of trouble? I'll give you an example. Two things were said about me. I was controversial and I was political. Well, if I'm talking about freedom, in the middle of communist Russia, I would be political because their politics were communists. But how can I be political in a free country talking about freedom unless it's political for a black man to think he should be free? So if I'm controversial in Russia talking about freedom, I'm talking against communism. I'm controversial. But how am I talking about freedom for my people in America? Am I controversial? Unless it's controversial for a black person to think they should be free. See the sickness in it? So you're going to be an activist. <laughs> no, we're freedom fighters. We know what we're fighting for. And, and, and unless you say it, your people don't know. White out there. 
You gotta say, I'll fight for your basic rights. Freedom, just equality. This morning, they showed that young white boy out west that that officer shot on his hands and knees five times to death, that they just let go. I wouldn't care what nobody say, that is tragic, that is foul, that was murder, he had no weapon, he posed no threat, you want him on his knees, he's on his knees, you want his hands in the air, they're in the air, he shot him five times, but he also said to him, crawl to me, that's it. See, you could have walked to him, you got to go, crawl to me. So he starts crawling, ow, 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 ow. Now what does that mean? Oh, they start to treat you. <laughs> the way they treated us. And then you go to that place called justice, and there ain't no justice. You see? Now, for them, 2017 and 16, they're experiencing it here and there. But think about a people, 1600, have never got a break from that unjust treatment. And then you want to vilify me and label me and make me the problem. Well, there was too much work to be done because you were, you were denied to be a police officer. You were denied to be a firefighter. You were denied the most really good jobs in this town. And you were put where they wanted you to be, right? Now, the other thing is that um, they built a project in the middle of the north side. And when they built the projects, um, in the middle they put a park called Summerfield, right? But we're in the north. Blacks were made to stay on the east side. Whites lived on the west side. The two should never mix. You see what I'm saying? So these lessons were consistent. This is Minneapolis. When I grew up, we saw our stars and our athletes in person. And we didn't see them because we wanted to see them. We saw them because they weren't allowed to get a room downtown. So the Phyllis Wheatley had upstairs rooms that they rented and the kitchen where they could feed you. So when we come to play, we saw our celebrities. Thank God we saw them, but they weren't there to see. They were there because they were treated as unhuman. And so you could not rent a room in liberal North Minneapolis, in liberal, the city of Minneapolis, you know? You couldn't even go outside the city and get just a room for the night. And when you understand that, it didn't change anything but us. It made us want better. It made us want freedom, liberty, justice. It made us want education. It made us want to own a school. It made us want to vote. It didn't do nothing to them. They continued to join the Klan. <laughs> they continued to invent more hate organizations. They continued to have church on Sunday with just themselves. They continued to run to the suburbs to get away from everybody else. So when that's in your heart, don't expect to go be in work where they work. So, no, we, it would take God himself in person, maybe. It might shoot him because he says something different. But it might take God himself to tell them to stop. And, and I'm not saying that as Spike Moss, I'm saying that from, if 1600 wasn't enough for you, <laughs> 2017, if that wasn't enough for you, 1600? And to know what was done to us in 1600, 1700, 1800s? And to still treat us like we enslaved you? The most painful thing that I saw, which should be a movie or a book, I'd say was 91 Days. And that's when King died, white people from suburbs, would enter into North Minneapolis and just shoot at black people at random because they felt you no longer had a leader. And we organized ourselves in the Black Patrol. The police that pulled out of community let it happen. So we unarmed ourselves and we fought back for 91 days. This town, this state was so filthy, the world didn't even know that battle was going on for 91 days. But people like myself and Boosie that you met, uh, we're survivors of it. And we can tell the world about that 91 days of black youngsters and black adults, shoulder to shoulder, fighting for our community. And what I was really proud about, we did three shifts a day, is that we didn't leave until 
The last cars came through shooting. That's when we go dead. But I'm proud about the fact when they stopped coming each night, black people would hug each other and say, I'll be back tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll be here. You know, it's amazing that uh, you're not in the army, you're not getting paid, and you're willing to stand up like that for your community, and you're telling somebody that you'll be back, and you really came back night after night to fight to defend the black community. And then the black patrol went to the south side, and then the Native American patrol to protect themselves. But we fought for 91 days. That was the second rebellion. The first rebellion, we were at the Opportunity Parade, which is the, the biggest parade of the city. And we witnessed the police beating. We didn't know, we thought it was a young woman at the time, but it was a 14 year old girl. And that created that first rebellion in downtown Minneapolis that spilled over into North Minneapolis. And that was the first time that the mayor actually came to the black community to see what we wanted. And out of that rebellion came the way because young people asked for their own place and a way out of this mess, a way to a new life. Well, you know, I came in there as a youngster. Uh, Seal Davis was after me all the way up into that rebellion. The morning after the rebellion, I went to him. I, I gave in. Whatever it is you want to teach me and whatever it is you want to make of me, here I am. And he began to first um, set me down with teachers. And the opportunities was, was massive. Like uh, one of my mentors was Dick Gregory. One was Fannie Lou Hamer. You know, to be able to sit down with Ali, to sit down with James Brown, you know, uh, to sit down with Stokely Carmichael, Fred Hampton, all these people I was exposed to in my development. And where I was looking at sports and helping kids play sports, I started looking at our reality. So I was running uh, football teams and track teams and boxing teams and drum and bugle corps. But I started looking at what can we do to change the condition and the fact we named this building the way, the way out, the way to a new day, let's begin to do that. And so for me, it was the struggle for economics. It was the struggle for fair housing. It was the struggle for every opportunity and every way we could flourish as a people. And some of our first battles, it automatically happened at educational institutions. That the more they knew, the more they didn't know. <laughs> and so we're on them campuses trying to get teachers, trying to get scholarships, trying to get the black houses and black studies. And, and that battle was one of the first battles we had. The employment battle was a natural the minute them kids got out of school that first summer to get them employed so they don't have to go break the law to have something and enjoy their summer. Um, the programs and things that we, we brought about, uh, the chain gang, to, to teach uh, each one teach one, um, the programs to employ youth, uh, to get them on a college campus, uh, to continue to do social stuff with them, uh, to create Little Miss Northside and Miss Black Minnesota, Black History Production, uh, Youth Appreciation Day, Juneteenth, uh, Northside Summer Fun Fest at Bethune Park every year, um, our own music school, which I was really proud of. Um, we went in so many directions, you know, the African dance, the African drum, uh, the black plays that we did, the black models that we put together to model. We went in a lot of directions to motivate and help our people change. But number one thing we did was black awareness. The way was responsible for making sure you would be proud of your hair, of your lips, of your skin, and walk with pride, and not walk and live as a defeated people, but a proud, loving, caring people. We went in three prisons a week for about 37 years to continue to encourage people to come out of there, change, don't go back, don't let them have you. We went into um, Turning Point to get people off of drugs and alcohol. Stanley King and Joe Buckhall and I, we went to the East Coast to meet with Reverend Sullivan to bring TCYC here. Today it's called um, Summit Academy. We sit down with several people and we were the founders of KMOJ. We did a lot of things that, you know, uh, you got up on Penn is North Point. 
Back then when we brought it here, it was Pilot City. But we were part of that. We, we, we brought the Urban League here. There wasn't no Urban League here. You know, so the way was at the root. We created a program called um, the Legal Rights Center. And we started with a sister from Alabama in the way named Willa Mae Dixon. In the courts, she ran into Doug Hall, and Doug Hall became my first lawyer, and we began to provide our people with free legal services, which eventually turned into the Legal Rights Center, but it came up out of that way. There wasn't hardly any avenue where we didn't go, you know. Um, it was Bobby Lau who was willing to head up our music school, and the reason we wanted him, he was a jazz musician. And he had went to uh, Japan and participated in Yamaha organ contest. When you win, you get that $10,000 organ and a record deal with Bobby. Congratulations. But there'll never be no little Bobbies unless you help us with the school. So the jazz musicians play late at night, so they get up midday. So we had to start our school, 1 and 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But out of that first class of bands, the best we had was called the Young Players. And Motel did come here to get them. They just wouldn't go. And uh, so it defeated the purpose. But out of that se second group of, of bands, the best out of that group was the family. And out of the family came the best musician we ever had. His name was Sonny Thompson. The next class, Sonny was teaching a student that went the furthest. He was teaching Prince. He was teaching Jimmy, Terry, Jimmy Jan, Terry Lewis. He was teaching Andre Simone. And we took music to another level. There was a, a lady that run, she, she ran, our father built the Walker Art, and her name was Louise McCann. And Louise would give us the money to get the instruments, then we could put them in the bands and put them on the road. And we ended up putting them on the stage with big stars everywhere we went. And so a lot of our programs was that type of successful. fed people, um, we tried to keep them occupied, um, they were so angry, and rightfully so. But when you talk to us, then you learn what you have to do now, because what we dealt with, because we dealt with it, they changed laws to insulate and protect themselves and give themselves the right to treat you the way they treat you. See, this is a state where you pass a law where a cop, all he has to feel is threatened, he can take your life. You pass a law where a cop's uh, license insurance, the state pays for it. If he was paying for it and he kept getting hit with his insurance and lost his insurance, he loses his license to practice. But well, we're paying for it. So when he beats you, he gets suspended for two weeks. If you get to go to court, this lawyer's paid for it out of your tax dollar. If you got a bail, your tax dollar pays for it. When he loses the case, he goes free, but the lawsuit, your tax dollar pays you for the lawsuit. What did he lose? So brothers and sisters in Black Lives Matter, which weren't led by us, uh, have got to slow down so they know how to go. Because the things that was there when we were there are gone. They have insulated themselves to protect themselves, to give themselves the right to treat you the way they treat you. And they justify it by making it law. I'm not ashamed. I don't apologize. And if I had to do it over, I would do it again. The unfortunate part is the generation behind us, their starting point is worse than where ours was. And they got far more to overcome. But they must soldier behind us the way we soldiered behind them. They must.